the end of our Boundary Line series, and I am feeling a certain way. I'm feeling a certain way. If you know me, you know I love to talk about two things all the time. I love to talk about the Bible, and I love to talk about relationships. And this relation, this whole relationship series has been about what? The Bible and relationships. So I feel like I'm in my jam, and now we're coming to an end. And if you know me, I have a problem with letting go. In fact, James tells us to confess your trespasses amongst the brethren. God is faithful and just to forgive us. What does that mean in regular people terms? It means that we're around each other, that we lay our sins down, and God will forgive us. So I just got to tell myself today and let you know, I just don't like letting go of things. I will even make it to the point where it's awkward. Like I'll stay in that hug a minute too long and make it awkward. Or, or I'll stay on the phone talking to my friends just a little bit longer. Or I, if the party's popping, I want to stay just an hour more. Or if the series is good and addicting, I just got to get one more episode in. Letting go is hard, but it's necessary. Trust me, trust me. I know this from experience because I have a pair of jeans in my closet. Some of y'all know where I'm going. They are 12 years old. I know that they're 12 years old because I had them when I married Matt 12 years ago. And I have these pair of jeans in my closet because I am going to fit in them yet again. All right? Some call it faith. Some call it foolishness. I'm calling it fitness. All right? Like I've lost some weight. Glory to God. But I still got another 30 pounds to go. And when I get those, down those 30 pounds, I'm going to butter myself back into those jeans. So I keep them as my motivation. But it's actually stupidity because if I lose 30 pounds, I deserve a new pair of jeans. You know what I'm saying? Yes. We don't like to let go of things. If if we're honest, we don't like to honestly assess in our lives the who or the what in our lives. But this is wildly important to our growth and to our spiritual success. success. As we dive into the pages of scripture and close up this series, I want to ask ourselves this key question. What in my life today doesn't fit my tomorrow? What in my life today doesn't fit my tomorrow? Is it a thought pattern? I'm always a loser. I'm never going to succeed. I'm always going to be this. Is it a bad thought pattern that you need to remove and get away? Is it a sin that the Lord has been talking to? You need a boundary with that sin. No more. Is it a person? It is a person or a relationship that no longer fits. Oh, some of y'all came with your church faces, so let me make it plain. It's the drinking buddies from college that you just like, oh, no, but when I'm with my guys, like, I don't have to think about anything. They really know me but is that benefiting you? Maybe you need a boundary. Maybe it's the guy that you've been, you know, talking to and dating for three years on and off, but he doesn't have the Mr. Husband vibes and you're like panicked. You don't want to let go of him and set a boundary because you're like, I don't want to be alone. And the devil that I know is better than the devil that I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe, maybe it is that friend that hasn't been a good friend to you in a while. And you find yourself saying, excuses and justifying bad behavior. Oh, well, I know their heart and this is just a season. Or maybe a family member, a cousin who's constantly competitive with you and what they have and what you don't have and you're just feeling a certain way and you find yourself saying, oh, but they're family. Hmm. Endings are hard, but they're necessary. Endings are necessary. Why are, why are endings hard? Well, because if you're anything like me, you're conflict avoidant. You want to avoid conflict like it's the plague. Or maybe you've gone down that path before, and the idea of you having to draw boundaries or cut off another relationship just feels hard. Or maybe, maybe you are afraid of the unknown. What will that mean for your life if that person or that thing or that coping mechanism is gone? Maybe you're here today and you face too many painful endings and you want to try to avoid another one. But we need to ask this pivotal question. Who is stopping you today from becoming who God wants you to be tomorrow? So just like my hope of magically losing 30 pounds by tomorrow is crazy, some of us have hope and expectations and delusions that require us to make necessary endings. What in my life today doesn't fit in my tomorrow? Who is stopping you from who God has called you to be? In the conversation we're going to take a look at today, we see a man by the name of Abram who was brought into a new city, to a new land, a new season, and he will be given a new name. And there's a consequence for not ending a relationship when he should have. 
if we don't know how to end things well, we will lose a lot. The title of today's message is Necessary Endings. So for the note takers, pull out your Bible, uh, your pens, your highlighters, and you're not going to understand this right now, but my hope is that you walk out that door as you click off of YouTube, that you could say to yourself, there's a lot to lose. In fact, let's practice right now. Can you repeat after me? Can you say, there's a lot to lose? lose. Yes. Turn with me in your Bible to Genesis 13, and this is where we're going to begin. Genesis 13, beginning in verse 5. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds, but the Lord could not support them while they stayed together, for the positions were too great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herds and Lot's, and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Cellulites were also, I was just making sure you guys were paying attention, good. They were all living in the land at the time. It was crowded. Verse eight, so Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between us. Bro, let's not have any beef. No, we family. Let's not have beef between your herders or mines, for we're close relatives. Is not the whole lamb before you? Let, let's part company. Let's separate ways. If you go left, I'll go right. And if you go right, I go left. So we are going to take a look and slowly unpack this narrative in a second. But I think some context is needed for our own personal lives. When we assess how we are living our lives, we usually can fall into three categories. One, dying. Two, surviving. Or three, thriving. And y'all, it's a level three for me, okay? I have a short life to live and I don't wanna just barely be surviving. Oh, I just made it through the day. No, no, no. And I, I speak to many people and it's with this understanding, this mindset of like literally barely hanging on, like, like emotional life support, we're dying. I'm dying to a sense of hope. I'm experiencing a failure to, to thrive. And again, surviving is good, but I believe that God has called us to thrive. If you're part of this community, we, this is what we preach. This is why we drive and strive to godly ambition because we believe that we are going to be 1% better every single day to the glory of God. That we get, we get one earthly life to live and why waste it? Being basic, wearing beige, eating bananas, eating vanilla ice cream. No, God has called us to thrive and be successful. Successful in spiritual sense. I mean, if he blesses you worldly sense, like praise God, I hope he ties on it. But listen, right now, honestly, I I believe that God has called us to thrive spiritually. Now, what does this look like in, er- in the earthly kingdom, in earthly culture? Well, thriving looks like amassing more money, getting more followers, getting a bigger house, having more friends, more, 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 adding, multiplying, absolutely. In kingdom culture, though, it's different. Um, in fact, uh, there's a term that Dr. Um, Henry Cloud used in his book, Necessary Endings, that I read about 10 years ago and really changed my perspective on so much. But he uses a term called pruning. We have to prune areas of our life, prune people or or jobs. We have to prune areas of our life. What is that? Pruning removes things that stunt our growth so that that we can create space for us to grow. Now, I want you to hear me clearly. I understand that you want addition in your life, but the addition that you want in your life will come through subtraction. If you're sitting here today and you're like, I want a multiplication, I want it to be cubed, I want it to be the fourth power, I want God to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that I can ask, think, hope, or imagine, good for you. I want that too. But sometimes our addition, the multiplication that you want to see in your life comes through a season of subtraction. My hope over the course of the last seven weeks that we have been in this series, that we have learned that boundaries are not burdens, boundaries are blessings. That's that's what we wanna walk away with. That you don't have to have a pity party because you're in a season of subtraction. No, you could have a little praise party, yes, Jesus, because, because I know that if God is removing it from me, it's because I don't need it. If God is removing something from me, it's because he's about to give me something. And I don't know what needs to be subtracted in your life. I don't know who needs to be subtracted in your life, but I'm here to tell you that God will never take away something that you need. God will not take away something that you need. Now, he may take away something that you want. He may take away something you like. 
He may take something away that you lean upon. He may take something away that you're addicted to. But if he takes it from you, it's because he's trying to replace it with himself. He wants to show you that he is all that you need. And I haven't just seen this in my life. Uh, about 10 years ago, a close friend was dating this amazing guy. Like when I say amazing, I'm talking like amazing. HTT, head to toe amazing. Love Jesus. Like pff, winner, winner, chicken dinner, okay? Love Jesus. Had amazing teeth. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> what? He had a dope job. I mean, bringing in money. Not just a Christian, not just a follower of God, but he's one of those real Christians that was in a discipleship group. Oh my gosh. He would read his Bible and journal. Oh my God, are you serious? And he was fine. Like they probably has little chocolate drop babies. He's a good looking man of God. Like literally, I'm like, oh, you found your Boaz. Yes, girl, amazing. So when they broke up, I was thoroughly confused. God, why would you do that? Why, why would you do that? I mean, this, this guy was amazing. What I realized in that season, what we know looking back retrospectively, is that he became the all-sufficient. He became the goal. He became everything. And I think that God will take us through seasons of subtraction to let us know that he is our all-sufficient. He is all that we need. And some attraction, I mean, some addition comes through subtraction. So, I, I, I'm passionate as we wrap up this series that we learn this concept because there is a lot to lose. In our foundational passage in Genesis, it gives us some insight to some issues. It, this text allows us to experience and expose a relationship between a man named Abram and his nephew named Lot. So let me refresh our memory in verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, his nephew, let us not have any beef between us. Between your herders and mine, we're family, dog. We're family. No. Uh, is not the land before us huge? We don't have to squabble over this. Now, there is so much to unpack in these chapters between Genesis 12, 13, and 14. So much to unpack. But for the sake of boundary lines, for the sake of our tie-up, I'm just asking this pivotal question, and I'm going to take a look at this relationship. Who is Lot? Yes. Lot is a family member, a nephew, but, but I want to ask us a deeper question. Who is Lot to you? Who is the Lot that's costing you a lot? So as we go through this passage, I want to set a bar of defining who Lot is. More than just Abram's nephew, Lot, as we see in scripture, one theologian put it this way, Lot represents someone you care for, someone you have affection for but you are not responsible for, that you need to set boundaries with. I'm going to say it twice because it was nice. Lot represents someone you care for, you have affection for, but you're not responsible for, that you need to set boundaries with. So as we are tying up the, the, the final week of this series, this is, we, this is what we've been talking about the last seven weeks. Now, we know the boundaries are not a bad, that boundaries are not a burden, boundaries are a benefit, but now I want us to know it here, to take it from here to here. And how do we do that? We implement it into our life. This is now the hard work. We've been giving you tools for the last seven weeks, and now we're going to have to do. Because the truth of the matter is that there are many of us that are helplessly waiting on someone to get a revelation of what's in their best interest. That we're sitting here like wishing and wondering and pouring and discipling and mentoring into, hoping and praying that they get a revelation of what God has for them. But you can't care more about their destiny than they do. So my, I, I, I want to unpack this slowly. I don't want you to feel a certain way. I want us to go to the pages of scripture because if we don't start now articulating boundaries and setting boundaries, it won't just affect them, it will affect us. And if somebody says that they love you, but they reject your boundaries, they're not for you. They may not like your boundaries. They might not understand your boundaries. They may have questions about your boundaries, but if they love you and if they are for you, they will understand your boundaries. If you keep, listen, listen to me, please. If you keep accommodating bad behavior and thinking that you're loving them, you're not being loving, you're being used. And I believe that it is high time for some necessary endings. Necessary endings. Look at verse 5. Now Lot 
who was moving about with Abram also had flocks and herds and tents. Now, remember, remember, yes, Lot is Abram's nephew, but Lot represents the person that you have affection for. You care for them, but you are not responsible for them. And here, whether we intentionally or unintentionally, our enablement becomes entitlement. We tried doing the best, but we broke boundaries. Our motive was right, but the motion was wrong. So, whether consciously or unconsciously, there are people in our life that we are enabling, and that enablement, that enabling turns into entitlement. The passage of the scripture is about a man named Abram. So I'm going to geek out for a second. Abram, the name Abram means exalted father, singular. He is about to have a name change. Any vacation Bible school kids in the place, tell me what Abram's name changes to. Yes, yes, Bible scholars, you guys make me so proud. Abram becomes Abraham. Abram, which means exalted father, bad daddy. Yes, number one dad. Bad daddy, um, as in bad as in good, singular, becomes Abraham, father of multitudes, father of many. Why is this ironic? Because Abraham didn't have no kids. And in that culture, your kids were your currency. Your kids were the favor of God. So here's a man whose name is number one dad, and he didn't have any kids. But God changed his name because it is going to be a sign to Abraham that God is a God who keeps his promises. And what I want us to hold on to and know for the sake of this passage is how you handle Lot determines whether or not you stay Abram or become Abraham. How you handle your lot determines whether or not you stay Abram or become Abraham. I need you to catch this because Abraham represented the potential of who Abram could become, who Abram was called to, who Abram was purposed to, who Abram was created to be. It was the best version of himself. And we are constantly, if we are constantly taking care and thinking about other people, it might compromise the calling that God has on your life. What God requires of you is going to require two hands. We just recorded the church podcast, and this image came to mind. In plowing, which is an agricultural term, in plowing, you're sowing seed. The Bible used this analogy for us as Christians serving the Lord. A plow turns up the ground. You need two hands on that plow. And if you have one hand on the plow, guess what? Your plow is going all the wrong direction. You need two hands on the plow. If you are taking one hand off your plow to drag someone behind you, guess what? You are now losing the direction of where God has called you. Now, remember, remember, the definition of lot is someone that you have affection for, someone you care about, but are not responsible for, that you need to draw boundaries with. And sometimes boundary can make us feel as if we're not being loving. And we feel like we're making accommodations out of love. But accommodations always say yes. Love will sometimes say no. So being loving is setting boundaries. And if we're not careful, our accommodations and our affection and our trying to salvage a relationship will be unhealthy, unhelpful, and unwise. And this is what we see Abraham did. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this Bible story, but in just one chapter before, Genesis chapter 12, Abram receives a revelatory word from God. God says, Abram, I'm going to send you to a new land with new people and out of this country, and I want you to, to go with your kin, go with your people, your initial family, to a land that I will show you. There's nothing wrong with that land. There's nothing wrong with those people. But for you to become who I'm calling you to be, I need you to go to a land with people who will not remind you of what you were. In Genesis 12, 1, God tells Abram to leave his country and to leave his family, and he will bless him. So for Abram to become Abraham, a separation was required for his success that his blessings required boundaries in his life. Why did God tell Abram to leave his lands and his people? Because there are some people who aren't going to let you be Abraham. They know you as Abram. They like you as Abram. They roll with you at Abram. But when God is taking you to Abraham, they don't like that version of you. They, they're going to like the inferior version of you. 
And if no one has told you this, let me tell you this in love, that there will be people who want to love the lesser version of you. In Genesis 12, God tells Abraham, what I need you to go through is a little bit of separation, not because your family's not good, not because your, 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 your old land is not good, but I am taking you to a place um, where that is no longer necessary. And some people have to get this because to go where God is calling us to go, um, you won't be able to move up until you learn how to move on. This is why necessary endings matter. God tells Abram to leave his land and to leave his family. So what did Abram do? Now you're not going to talk to me. What did Abram do? He left his land. He left his land. And I don't know how I have missed this every time I have read this passage. But Abram partially obeyed. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 4. Don't turn there. It's on the screen. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Good job, Abram. Amazing. And Lot went with him. What? What? He took his kid with him. He was not supposed to. Remember, you could take your children, but he ain't got no children. He took his nephew. And many of us are stepping into new seasons and new lands because we're afraid of being alone. So we take people and relationships, bad habits, bad thought patterns, bad addictions with us because we're afraid of doing this alone. So God says, no, I want you to leave. And Abram took someone with him. Listen, not everyone we love is assigned to the land that we are going to live in. That's truth. In Genesis 13, 5, we actually now see the problem that happened. We see the consequence of Abram not obeying. There's now beef between Abram and Lot. Have you ever dealt with the frustration and the fallout of trying to drag someone to a level that they don't have an appetite for? Have you ever seen potential in someone? And you're like, if you just were to level up to your potential, can you imagine what God do? And they resent you because of it? That's frustrating. And Abram doesn't see the immediate implications of his actions. It's not until much later. He didn't know that his kindness and his generosity was going to be flipped and turned into entitlement of more. And I want to pause for a second and talk about the emotional epidemic of entitlement. It's dangerous. And the reason why I want to pause for a second is because it affects every country, every continent, and every socioeconomic area that we, we live in. People with, that have a lot feel entitled. People that have nothing feel entitled. Well, what is entitlement? Do we go above and beyond what is required, above and beyond what is reasonable, and above and beyond what is warranted for people, and it's still not enough? Look at what happens. Look at verse 8. We're going to read it again. So Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. Abraham is wise. He's saying, hey, for us to have peace, I need to create some boundaries because we can't be cool and be this close. I love you. I I want to see you thrive and I want to thrive, but we got to set some boundaries in place. The land isn't the problem, but I'm going to set some boundaries so we don't have a problem. If we want to be in relationship, this is how we have to do it. He's trying to preserve the relationship. And he's saying, hey, my flock can't continue to grow and us to be this close. And then in verse 9, we see Abram. I see the humanity of Abram. I see the humanity of Abram because he's overly accommodating his nephew. That land was his. Did y'all catch that? That land was his. And he says, you pick first. You get what you want. You go left, I go right. Look at this land that we have. You go first. Overly accommodating. If you, wherever you go, I'll go the other way. So Lot gets to pick the best land and the best lot for Lot. You know what I'm saying? Look, look at verse 12. Jump down to verse 12. Abram lived in the land of Cana, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. I have one Holy Spirit that went to vacation Bible school over there that was like, "Mm -hmm." listen, if you are a sanctified saint, you will hear the name Sodom and know that's not where good children of God belong. Look at, look at verse 13. Now the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Oh, there's going to be some vacation Bible school kid that's going to know a story. They're going to let this marinate and they're going to shout, why would you do that lot? 
You had all the land to pick for, and you went there? Of all the places that you can go, you went there? I love that scripture says that he pitched a tent near Sodom. <clears throat> so I don't want to throw shade at Lot because I think so many of us do this exact thing. We pitch our tents right along the borderline. Do you catch that in scripture? He said that he pitched his tent right near Sodom, like just right there. And I think what we do as Christians is we say, Lord, where's the boundary and how far can I go? And then we do the exact same thing. We pitch a tent right near Sodom. But what happens? Pretty soon he starts shimmering over the line and he ends up being, instead of next to Sodom, he ends up in Sodom. And this is what happens. I, I, I wanna pause for a second because if we're honest, we've seen this happen in people's lives. I want us to be like people that, again, we don't call people out. We call people up. We want more for them. We could say, hey, you're too close to Sodom. Baby, you're too close to sin. I'm not judging, but I'm saying they're not a good influence. I'm not saying they're wrong. I just don't think it's the right people for you. That's who I want to be. To constantly remind, hey, all of us in a moment can be Lot, but all of us have potential to be Abraham. And this is what happens. Lot goes from being right on the borderline of Sodom to moving into Sodom. What happens? Sodom is sieged. The city is taken over. Lot, all his family, and all his possessions are taken to a foreign land. Well, word gets to Abraham. And what does Abraham do? Does he say, sucker, ha <laughs> ha, that's on you? Nope. He's a good man. And he goes and helps his nephew. And he sends 318 trained soldiers to go and to rescue the people of Sodom. Lot was rescued and his family. And scripture says all his possessions came back. So in, that, in my theater of my mind, Abraham's like, yeah, go God, Yahweh, you the man. That's right. My nephew's going to go and he's going to be united. He's going to find a new place to live. I can imagine him in the theater of my mind looking at his nephew Lot and say, now I know you are not going to go back. You're not going to go back to Sodom. I know, you know what Proverbs says, don't be like a dog that goes back to his vomit. You're not going to go back to Sodom. Where does Lot go? He goes back to Sodom. He goes back to Sodom. And I want to pause for a second because my, my concern is, is that of all the places that we can pick and choose, why do we go back to a place? Now, yes, Lot went physically to Sodom, but I think it's a metaphor for spiritually, where we go back to our sin or we go back to the places that were not for us. So Abraham has to stop what Abraham is doing. Abraham has to leave his flock. Abraham has to use his resources and his trained men to go rescue his nephew. Have you ever done that? You made phone calls for them. You open up doors for them. You ask for favor. People who don't know them, but people know you and they love you. They want to help them. Have you ever done that? For them to make a bad decision? Lot goes straight back to Sodom. And I'm telling, this is what I want you to hear as we look at this scripture. I'm not saying not to help people. Please, please, please don't pick up what I didn't lay down. I'm not saying not to help people. I'm saying that we can use this story to help us reevaluate whether or not we're actually helping, to reevaluate if our helping is actually hurting. Am I empowering them or am I enabling them? I want us to be responsible for that. And when, I, I, when these moments come, I have to ask a spiritual question. What are the consequences for my life if I'm responsible for someone else's irresponsibility? What are the consequences for your life for being responsible for somebody else's irresponsibility. Because at some point, you're gonna say, I have to be responsible for what God has called me to. I am not saying don't help people. I'm saying set up good boundaries. Because a lot of the problems that we're experiencing in our life isn't because people are bad or you're bad, there's bad boundaries. What adjustments do you need to make? As we wrap up this series, we spoke about pruning. I wanna make this so practical. But I also want to be honest, pruning hurts. It hurts. It's a cutting away. Who or what in your life needs to be pruned? 
And how do we make this practical? I just want to give us two handles as we wrap this up. I want us to look at expectations. If you're the note taker, I want you to write down manage expectations. Because what can you expect from this person? If you were with us in week one, we had uh, three different categories. We have casual friends, we have close friends, and we have core friends. What can you expect from these people? And, and, and I want to, to justify, I want to validate and say, your expectations might be totally fair. You, asking someone to be considerate is not, is not unrealistic. Asking someone to be kind is not unrealistic. Asking someone to show up on time is not unrealistic. Asking someone to be appreciative is not unrealistic. It just might be unrealistic for them. So Jesus put it this way, know a tree. He didn't say judge a tree. He didn't say value a tree on its worth. He said, you need to know a tree. In church, how do you know a tree? By their fruit. You know a tree by their fruit. Believe in their potential. Invest in their potential. But make sure you're inspecting the fruit. Because some of us are setting our expectations on their potential and not on their fruit. You can believe in their potential. You can invest in them. But if you aren't evaluating the fruit, be careful. Because if the fruit comes out funky, you know there's an issue. The second way that we evaluate and prune is investments. Who are you investing in? And this is a matter of stewardship. We have one earthly life to live, and God gives us a certain amount of time, a certain amount of resources, a certain amount of energy, and we have to be careful where we're making investments. Let's pull this out of the relational side, and let's make this mathematic or economic. If I'm going to invest in stocks, NASDAQ, Dow Jones, I'm not just going to willy-nilly just be like, oh, that's a cute one. I'll put my money in there. If I'm not getting a return on investment, is that a good investment? It's not. So you have to evaluate, who are you spending time with? Who are you spending money on? Who are you spending your resources on? Here's the truth. I know that all of us would want to give money away to those in need and hang out with everyone and go to every single birthday party and every single funeral. You want to be there. You want to help everyone and open up every door. But it's a matter of biblical stewardship. I have limited resources. And I want to be careful with who I'm investing with. And if you keep on investing in someone with zero return and expecting a different result, that's no longer on lot, baby. That's on you. Many of us need to ask for wisdom. And I'm not telling you to give up on lot. Please hear me. I'm not saying give up on lot. I'm saying give lot to God. Because if you've loved all that you can love and you've helped in every way that you can help, give them over to God. Because when your investment turns into resentment, it's time to let Lot go. It's time to let Lot go. If you don't deal with Lot, you will lose a lot. And there's time for necessary endings. We as a community want to breathe life and biblical insight and ask the Spirit of God to give us wisdom on what to do. I'm not saying to cut people out and cut people off. I'm not, that's not what you hear me saying. You hear me say good boundaries. And when those boundaries are broken, we have decisions to make. I want us to think long and hard because this is going to be the hard work of enacting all that we've learned over the last seven weeks. And I want to speak to those right now who just feel a sense of heaviness. I see the genuineness of your heart. I see that you care. And it wouldn't hurt like you hurt if you didn't care like you cared. The truth of the matter is, is the devil wants you to have a hard heart, wants you to be angry and hold resentment, and then take it out on other people. I will never give. I will never invest. I'll never do that for them. I'll never do that for her. I'll never do that for him. I'll never, never, never. Because the enemy wants you to be hard. But that's not your heart. What does it look like to continue to love, to set up boundaries, to make good investments, to assess your world and say, God, give me wisdom. I know in this moment, many of us are going to have to make some hard and critical decisions moving forward. So we're relying on the Holy Spirit to tell us what to do and how to do it. In a moment, the worship team's just gonna sing over us, but I'm gonna pray over us right now. And the Spirit of God will speak to you and show you how to move forward. Because if you can't let go, we won't move up. Spirit of living God, we give you this space. We ask that you speak to us in a way that only you can. Minister to us, move in this space, show us what we need to do. 
Let us make good investments. Let us assess expectations. We need you to become who you are calling us to be. In Jesus' name.